should we prepare the listeners for the fact that you were drinking White Claw the whole time? Uh, sure. Yeah. They could turn it into a game where they could listen to the episode and try to find the moment where the White Claw starts to sweat. It's like the audio <laughs> version of Where's Waldo? Where's White Claw? <laughs> yeah. I think you'll start to hear it around 35, 45 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I wanted to get a little looser, uh, you know, uh, for the show. We were recording at night, which we don't normally yeah. do. It was really hot. White Claw is super refreshing. <laughs> I think I got, I got a little overly refreshed uh, during the recording of the show. We also found out immediately after the fact that White Claw has terrible politics. So that may be the white last White Claw that Chad ever had. It's very depressing. Um, but, you know, we hope that the conversation went to some interesting places. Yeah, I thought it went well. Uh, I had a fun time uh, talking. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, despite, you know, like, even aside from the White Claw, I, I thought it was still a good conversation. Um, uh, one of the things that resulted from uh, the White Claw fiasco was that I forgot to put in one of the best, probably the best clip uh, that I came across in my research, uh, which is an entire album uh, with uh, lyrics by Senator Orrin Hatch and singing by... (laughs) The Osmonds Second Generation, which as far as I can tell, are the children of one of the lesser known Osmonds. I think Alan Osmond. Uh, the album is called I Love America. And <laughs> it and it is uh, exactly what it sounds like. So I, I'll just I'll put a, I'll put some links into in the show description for you and and uh, plead. Definitely do yes, that. Please check them out because. It's insane. I don't know how an album called I Love America written by a senator has not like um, sort of been in the news at all. But like the <laughs> the maximum number of views any of these songs have is 500 and some like uh, most of them have like 50 views <laughs> on YouTube. All right. So, let's try uh, to get those views yeah, up for Senator let's Hatch. Let's get Senator Hatch views up. I'm sure he's checking in on this. And uh, they've been up for like four years. Too. <laughs> it's very sad. <laughs> Welcome to Zero Sum Empire, the podcast that's taking a critical census of the 540 mostly anonymous American billionaires. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Episode 13. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. So you may know if you've listened to the show before that each week we talk about billionaires in the news and we intend to do that here and now. Is that right? Anything else we need to say before we go into billionaires in the news? Uh, nope. All right. Billionaires in the news. I feel like uh, the last couple of weeks we've had really full billionaires in the news weeks. A um, lot of stories that were interesting to talk about. I actually had kind of a tough time finding one this week. But uh, at the last minute, I came through with an article about uh, the Democratic presidential candidates with the most donations from billionaires. This I want to know about. I'm curious. You do? Yeah. You want to play a guessing game? Sure. Uh, so you haven't seen the article? Nope. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't realize that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we can play a game with it. Uh, guess who has the most. <laughs> what's the, What's our source here? <laughs> oh, uh, Forbes. Uh, but, I mean, it's FEC, it's FEC filing. So it's, okay. it, it, it's factual information from, you know... Uh, the federal federal election commission about who donated to whom, but the article was written by Forbes. Okay, who got the most billionaires support? Who has received the most donations thus far from billionaires? Before you guess, let me qualify it and say these are not donations to like super PACs. So these are not like billionaires giving you know a hundred thousand dollars to somebody or anything like that. This is just them maxing out the, like, what is it, $2,800 or something? It's just like personal, yeah, $2,800 personal contributions to individual candidates. Okay, well, let me tell you what my answer would have been had I not heard that last piece of clarifying information. My answer would have been Biden. My answer now, and this is only because we had a conversation about this maybe a week and a half ago, 
where you revealed to me that Mayor Pete was getting a lot of money from rich people. My second backup guess is Mayor Pete. It it is Mayor Pete, and it's it's Mayor Pete uh, by a lot. Um, Twenty three billionaires have uh, maxed out donations to Mayor Pete. Remember, there's only like uh, I mean, how many are there? Five hundred and forty. Five hundred and forty. I think it's actually a little bit more since we started doing the show. I think it's like five sixty now. But uh, but like that is what like the, you know uh, I guess it's not that much. It's a five, is that five percent of billionaires roughly. Not not quite. Maybe like yeah. You know. So like a, a substantial number of all of the billionaires are interested in Mayor Pete, which is very weird. Um, that is because weird. he he's not he's not clearly the most pro business candidate. Um, he like what is in fact what is he most clearly right? Like it's it's not clear to me what his identity is. You know, part of it might just be that they think he has a good chance of winning and he's not abhorrent to them, right? Like he's not Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. Uh, So like, they're like, well, we could live with Mayor Pete. We think he's got a good chance. So let's get behind him early. I I don't know. Maybe that's it. Uh, Or maybe they want to be seen as socially progressive and they want to give money uh, to the the first sort of openly openly gay candidate is that true? Is he the first openly gay presidential candidate? I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, maybe that's part of it. But like you know, guys from Blackstone, Netflix, David Geffen. Here, here's a question that I have, or information that I'd be interested in knowing. Yeah, how many billionaires Obama was getting money from during the same period of his first? presidential run i mean i would guess even more um i think that like probably the biggest reason is that the scrutiny around billionaire donations was a lot less when obama was running for the first time Mm -hmm. you know he i think he was more or less as sort of progressive uh, as mayor pete uh like you know in terms of like policies mayor pete might even be a little bit to the left of obama where obama was in in 2000 and uh, eight at this point. That makes sense. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I would guess more, but but still, but oh, you know, between 20 candidates, right? Like you, you got to divide it up. Right. Um, 23 is a lot. You want to guess number two? My my, sec- say, my second guess would be Elizabeth Warren. Oh, interesting. What's the rationale? She's just a big person in the oh, race. So like she's, yeah, she's in, she's a top five. Obviously Bernie's yeah. not getting it. You know, uh, Bernie has zero. <laughs> he's, he, he's, I mean, it's very funny, right? Like because because Bernie is currently in second place, right? And and uh, he has uh, the the only other people who have zero uh, billionaire donors are people who have you know basically zero percent in the polls, right? Uh, Bill De Blasio, Tim Ryan, you know, like, uh, uh, but it's yeah, I mean, it's it's great. Uh, it's interesting that you say uh, Elizabeth Warren. I mean, I I might have actually guessed that as well. Uh, but uh, you know, and and saying that she's a proud capitalist and wants to you know reform capitalism and and that sort of stuff. Like you might okay, Ray Dalio or somebody will kick some money her way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but no, she's uh she's down and tied for twelfth hmm. uh, with only two. Hmm. Um. Remember, Mayor Pete had 23. Uh, the second place candidate has 18. So quite a drop from Mayor Pete. Is that uh, Biden? Still a lot. It is not Biden. Huh. That's also a good guess. Huh. Wow. In fact, Biden, if you want to know, Biden's not until number five with only 13 billionaires backing him. OK, so who's number two? I'm stumped. Cory Booker, 18. That's interesting. Was this before or after he had that disastrous answer on should we allow billionaires to exist? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Maybe it's because of that. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, and, and listeners aren't going to remember this because this was a while ago. But like the thing that like when Cory Booker was asked by The New York Times if he thought billionaires should exist, he basically – Spoke for like three minutes uh, <laughs> without committing to a yes or no answer, um, and so like it you was hear, bad. Yeah, it was very bad, and you can hear the sort of like, oh, a billionaire could figure out like, okay, so he's sort of like pro billionaire and entrepreneurship and that kind of thing. However, 
he also realizes that he has to kind of do this other rhetorical move where he is critical of us or something. Well, that's those are two interesting data points. Are there, is there anything else that we need to take away from this list? Kamala Harris is more or less tied with Cory Booker. Um, and then Michael Bennett, the Colorado guy who I'm pretty sure is sub 2% in the polls. Uh, he's got 15 billionaires backing him. Huh. Uh, and then Joe Biden at only 13 and then it just kind of like peters out. You got Hickenlooper, uh, Beto, uh, Amy Klobuchar, et cetera, et cetera. Until you get down to uh, uh, only one billionaire. There are a couple with just one billionaire. And it's uh, all of the uh, the sh- the uh, the comic relief candidates. Marianne right. Williamson has one billionaire. <laughs> she does have one billionaire. Andrew Yang has one billionaire. And Tulsi Gabbard also has We one know who Marianne Williamson's billionaire is. <laughs> no, it's not. Really? Because I, I, I that was what I thought, and I looked it up. It's uh, it's Rebecca Polad of the Polad family. Um, huh. I looked them up, and and you know she does various kinds of philanthropic work. And then you got Bernie down there at zero. So you know, I I would like. I, I mean, really, that's the only takeaway data point from this uh, for me. Okay. Is uh, is that there is only one candidate that the billionaire class has aligned against, and that's Bernie Sanders, and that should... uh... But it's also that they've aligned behind Mayor Pete, which is not something that I think most people would suspect. So, are you ready to talk to us about your billionaire for this week? Yeah, um, and his name is Philip Anschutz. Uh, it's A N S C H U T Z. You may have heard of him. Um, you sure you got that pronunciation was, right? Definitely right. It it is definitely right. I looked it up because I was saying Anschutz because I, I was just putting an, an L in there when <laughs> I first saw it. Uh, hmm. But it's Anschutz, uh, according to Wikipedia, which uh, I'm pretty it's sure is correct. Never about wrong. Everything. Yeah, it's never wrong. Um, a lot of people, you know, listening to this, I'm going to guess, know uh, Anschutz's name. Uh, he is probably, you know, like we're getting to the point where I can't remember every billionaire that we've covered at this point. But I think he's probably the richest that we've we've talked about. I'll just come um, clean and tell you that I don't know his name or know who he is at all. Well, if you lived in particular places, if you lived in Los Angeles, if you lived in Colorado, uh, you'd probably know his name. Uh, if you were a fan of Major League Soccer, you might know his name. He is in the top 30 richest Americans, uh, you know, and those rankings fluctuate, but like he's somewhere between 20 and 30, uh, around the top 100 worldwide. What I'm realizing is like he is he's so rich and his portfolio is like so diversified across so many different industries that it's not going to be possible to cover everything yeah. uh, adequately. We, we, we're running into this. I mean, especially people who have yeah. like big holding companies. Yeah. So what did you find interesting? Okay. Um, I'm just going to do a quick, as I always do, a quick biographical summary here. He inherited his fortune. His grandfather started a bank. And his father was an oil tycoon, so he inherited a big fortune. That's a pretty classic setup. Pretty classic. <laughs> um, uh, like most of the billionaires that we talk about, he goes out of his way to remain anonymous. Since he, his first interview in 1979, uh, he's only done two more. <laughs> he's given three interviews <laughs> in 40 years. Shocker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of those was for uh, Town and Country magazine in 2017. So one of them was actually pretty recent. And um, it's this very annoying, like glowing portrait um, that downplays a lot of the bad aspects of Ann Schutz's dealings that we'll get into later. Uh, but it does a very good job of quickly summarizing his career. Uh, so I'm going to read a short excerpt from the introduction, you know, kind of get a sense of who this guy is. Yeah, go for it. Many Americans believe their country is run by people they have never heard of, uh, which uh, that's the premise of this show. Uh, <laughs> that's us. <yeah. laughs> and, uh, and in the case of Philip Anschutz, they may be correct. Anschutz is an ordinary looking 77 year old resident of Denver who happens to be one of the richest men in America and a most enterprising one at that. 
If you've been to a concert recently by Taylor Swift, Kanye West, or Justin Bieber, Bieber, Justin Bieber, sorry, uh, uh, which I have. Uh, I mispronounced his name, but I do want to emphasize that I'm a, I'm a big believer, uh, and uh, like my like my girl Anne Frank, I'm a big believer. What? Um, uh, you don't remember? Yeah, when he went to visit. Uh, oh yeah, I Anne, remember that. Anne yeah. Frank home. He's he, like, you're right. She would have been a believer too. Yeah. I um, uh, that I you, think we're gonna cut all that out. <laughs> <laughs> no no i think that's got to stay you in. can't say like uh, my did you say like my girl like, <laughs> maybe that wasn't good i don't know it doesn't matter um it's Anne frank <laughs> i was channeling justin bieber I was oh like, god know, um channel somebody else all right. If you've been to Yellowstone National Park, Mount Rushmore, the Grand Canyon, your dollars likely found their way to him. Chances are you've heard of the basketball team he co-owns, the Los Angeles Lakers, or the railroad he used to hold, the Southern Pacific. It's possible that today you will start the morning by reading one of his newspapers, drive to work in a car fueled by oil from one of his wells, and catch an, uh, an uh, and at night catch a Hollywood blockbuster he produced in one of the hundreds of movie theaters he owns, actually thousands, uh, followed by a T-bone raised on one of his ranches. All right. He owns a lot of stuff. He owns a lot of stuff. Uh, most importantly, uh, quote, who knows, you might be paying him rent as you read this. Uh, Anschutz is currently the 22nd largest individual landowner in the United States. Uh, yet most people don't know his name. Uh, he owns Coachella. Uh, <laughs> really? Which is, is kind of funny. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, the Staples Center. <laughs> Uh, at least part of five soccer teams. Uh, a big one is Quest Communications, and you might not be familiar with them because I don't think you've lived out west. Um, uh, I lived in Tucson, Arizona for a while, and it was right after Quest. He bought Quest. Is it like Comcast of Arizona? Yeah, yeah. And every time you called customer service, it would say, U.S. West is now Quest. U.S. West <laughs> is now Quest. It's like they changed the name when you, when you bought it, I guess. Um so the uh, when I said thousands of screens, he actually owns uh, uh, Regal Entertainment, which has six thousand movie theater screens across the U.S. Hmm. Um, and so it's quite a bit. I really should know this guy's name. I'm feeling very no, sort me of too. I didn't know his name. I was calling him Ann Schultz. You know, uh, I didn't know his <laughs> name either. Um, uh, but uh, you know, it, like he actively seeks to stay out of, you know, out of the the press, right? Yeah. Um. So, like, what I'm going to talk about today, and and like, he's very concentrated in entertainment industries, and and that's okay. what I want to talk about the most. But that's today. why I feel like we should know, like, some sort of like mass media and society, like class. I should have. Oh yeah. This well, guy. yeah. I mean. Uh, whatever, whatever. Given that we're both media studies scholars, we it's, should absolutely know his name. We uh, don't just know because, anything important. <laughs> yeah, we're bad at our jobs. And uh, so. okay, anyway. Um. So he um. Uh. Some of his more. So he owns a lot of like print too. Uh. uh he, he. We're. I'm going to mostly talk about his movie studios. Uh. But he owns a lot of print. Uh. The Washington Examiner and the now defunct Weekly Standard. Um, uh, do you remember the weekly standard? I don't know. If it's you Republicans, remember. right? Right. Well, yeah, a special brand of Republican. A, a, it's a, it was, it's gone now, but it was a, like a neoconservative propaganda mill. Elliot Abrams, David Frum, John Bolton, uh, Bill Is Crystal. Bill Crystal? Yeah, I was about to yeah, say Bill he Crystal. he ran it. Yeah. It was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was literally a propaganda machine. It never made any money. I think it lost like $5 million a year. And when, when Anschutz bought it, he bought it for a million dollars. One million dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, like the readership was basically just like people who worked in the Bush administration. That was it. And, <laughs> and the main thing that people talked was, about it all the time though, it like loomed large. They did. The yeah. Yeah. They did talk about it all the time because it was like, you know, they were the people who did the most to solidify a link between Saddam Hussein and, and, uh, Al Qaeda. So yeah, he did that, but like that, that kind of, Oh, and the Washington examiner too, which is like the, you know, conservative, inverse of the Washington Post, or at least that's how, like, he has some of that stuff, but that's kind of anomalous for him. That's like more of a Rupert murdoch -y type of thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Anschutz's media stuff is, is very different. 
Uh, and I, I spent some time trying to like figure out what to call this. And I would call it a Christian conservative camp. Like camp and the Susan Sontag. Yeah, word. like cheesy, schlocky, campy uh, stuff. So like, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I, I did want to talk yeah. just very briefly about one thing that he did, because this is an issue that, that, that matters to me. He does do some films that are just straightforward propaganda. Um, like in 2012, he made a film starring Maggie Gyllenhaal and Viola Davis called uh, Won't Back Down. Hmm. And um, no one saw it. And it was widely panned for not only being a trash movie, but also being just obvious propaganda. Mm-hmm. And what it was propaganda for was uh, it was it was like it was an instruction manual for parents on how they could manipulate the legal system to take over a public school and transform it into a charter school. (laughs) Like, I didn't even know that that was a thing that could happen. Uh, But apparently this is an actual process that that exists in over 20 states and they're called parent trigger laws. And so wait, the film itself was sort of like celebrating this process? Yes. And telling parents what you have to do to get it done in your community. Wow. Um, And so like Maggie Gyllenhaal is like the mom who orchestrates this takeover of a school. And uh, the way the way parent trigger laws work is you get if you can get more than half in most cases, more than half of the parents of a school to sign a petition, you file it with the school district and then they have to, by law, follow the recommendations of the parents. And often the recommendation is to turn the public school into a charter school. Huh. Um, and uh, uh, let's let's listen to the trailer of uh, of Won't Back Down. Okay. I think you'll get an idea of what it's like. We're late. We're late. Go, go, this go. This school doesn't care. I care. Stop. 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 Try it again. Cody, you can do it. Come on. I don't get it, Mom. I can't wait. With 10,000 studies about how being poor affects education, I can tell you being poor sucks and my kid can't read. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, like, it's hard to describe the aesthetic precisely, but you can you get it. It's melodramatic. It's over the top. I don't know if you want to talk about charter schools, but like. Uh, I don't. Very... Let's talk about okay. them some other time. That's let's let's talk about them another time and just put a pin in it and say charter schools are extremely bad, but something that billionaires love because what it does is to privatize the uh, privatize children's education and introduce the profit motive into something that's supposed to uh, uh, augment democracy. Right? Like it's a and we're we're going to come back to this idea at the end because it's all of a piece, right? Like it's all. It's all part of Philip Anschutz's, you know, worldview. Okay, so what else do you have? Yeah, so um, uh, like most of the stuff that he does is not straightforward propaganda like that. He uh, he does this like campy stuff, and and he is an evangelical Christian. Um, uh, he uh, he's also a huge Republican donor, one of the biggest in the country, but like. It's uh, the the way that his evangelism and his conservatism come through in the films is in a very weird way. Uh, And that's what I like. That's what I spent a little bit of time thinking about in in preparing for this. And so let me play another trailer. This is for a movie called A Dog's Purpose. And uh, do you remember this? (laughs) No. You don't remember A Dog's Purpose? No. It it was popular. I guess they made a sequel. What year is this? A Dog's Journey. Um. Oh, 2017. It's actually very recent. So let's uh, let's play a dog's purpose, uh, and here we go, and <laughs> and you'll get a kind of sense of of what what his aesthetic is. Okay. What is the meaning of life? Oh God. Are we here for a reason? <laughs> is there a point to end? Just wait. <laughs> and why does food taste so much better in the trash? This was me, and then this was me. <laughs> oh, a lot please stop there. One. Thank it you. Makes you. It makes you want to shrivel into a tight little ball. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> That's it's very right. family friendly, family oriented, right? Like, and, and there's not going to be anything ever in there that offends a family, but it, it's going to have. It offends what, me, and I have a family. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, that's a good point. Uh, so usually it's not, you know, um, but, uh, but like embedded in that film, I haven't watched the film, but it doesn't matter because I have plenty of other evidence to back this up. Embedded in the film is an ethical worldview, is a, a particular kind of morality that I think is extremely common with billionaires and, and 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 worth like talking about a little bit. Okay. What do you got? Okay. So like this might start to make more sense if uh when you when you know that Anschutz is also the only funder, it's part of his family foundation of the Random Acts of Kindness Foundation. Hmm. It's mission is to promote people doing random acts of kindness. And, and that's sort of it. On the surface, it's hard to object to that. Right. But that's what I'm going to do. And and uh, and I just want to warn people <laughs> ahead of time, that, like what I'm going to do here is to uh, criticize uh, doing random acts of kindness. Um, the, uh, <laughs> oh, the, man, we're walking on thin ice now. I, yeah, no, I think, I think the audience will agree with me by the time we get through this. Uh, so recently he... He kind of extended this. He upped the ante and he created the foundation for a better life. Uh, and the foundation for a better life does a lot of advertising on Fox News. This is an ad funded by billionaires to get people to hold positive attitudes. <laughs> and but it's promoting and, the foundation. But it's also no, 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 no. It's just it's promoting. It's just like a be nice advertisement on yes, Fox News. There is no, there is no call to to donate. Uh, there is, in fact, very little evidence that the organization does anything else than promote acts of kindness and being good. Okay, so um, before we go further in this critique, I just, on the behalf of myself and on behalf of the show, I just want to make clear that both of us do believe that it's in, important to be kind and to do good in the world. We don't object with that at the philosophical level. I can see where you're going, but I just want to make it clear. Okay. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. That, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. We believe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you need to qualify my statements. Like, it's a little bit weird. Like, well, you think, I mean, I can, like, you know, uh, you see, I, I can see you thinking that I'm going to tread on dangerous territory and you're trying to preempt <laughs> yeah. me being offensive kind of. in some way. You kind yeah. of. Well, yeah. I'm not. I am I am not going to be offensive. Okay. I, All right. I have Sorry. A, a very solid argument here. Okay. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to play some clips so that people okay. understand what we're talking about here. Cool. Uh, let's see. I'll play. I liked this one. It's just called Wonder. <laughs> Okay. That is so cool. Wow. Is wonder in you? <laughs> it goes to remind people, even if it's just for a second, how they saw the world before it became ordinary. It's wonder that inspires magician <laughs> Nate Stanaford. <laughs> To give people that sense of wonder. Wow. Oh, dude. Wow. You can find wonder everywhere. Wonder. It's in me. Wonder is in me. And wonder what? is in you. Now, pass it on from passiton.com. That's it. That's the whole thing. There are, there are dozens of these. Uh, confidence, love, <laughs> leadership, <laughs> compassion, fitness, soul, dedication, optimism. I really liked leadership. Uh, let's listen to leadership because... It is, uh, it, it's a, as far as I can tell, it's just an advertisement for George Washington. <laughs> they were outnumbered, Ready. out-equipped. Hey. They had no chance of winning, but they had one huge advantage. General George Washington. <laughs> the fate <laughs> of unborn millions will now depend under God on the courage and conduct of this army. We what? have the resolve to conquer or die. Just as the leadership of one man helped form a nation, today leadership can transform the world. Leadership is in you. Now pass it on from passiton.com. Yep. That's it. Dude. Okay, so this is amazing. I thank you for turning me on to this. But so, ah, uh, what's the now you're curious? What's the through line? Yeah. Yes, I want to play one more, and okay. it's called inclusion. And this is where I realized what was happening. It took okay. me. A, I had to listen to a few of these before I realized what it was all about. Uh, but the inclusion uh, solidified it. Here we go with inclusion. 
Inclusion is just walking up to someone and being yourself. Inclusion. Let's pass it on. Like 18-year-old Sarah Grecian. My twin brother Jacob has an autism spectrum disorder. He didn't have any friends. So Sarah took action. She started Score a Friend. Including people with differences is the right thing to do. Inclusion is in you. Now pass it on. From Okay, so <clears throat> inclusion, as they say in the beginning, is just walking up to someone and being yourself. Like what yeah. you realize, <laughs> what you what you realize from all of these is that all moral prescriptions, right? Whether it's being a good leader, having compassion, or showing love, or or being inclusive, it is all a matter of your individual attitudes and actions in interpersonal situations. Right. Like yeah. that's what the whole thing is about, right? Yeah. There's no villains. There's no systemic yeah. problems. There's right. random acts, right? There's just right. random acts that one performs that makes you a good person. Uh, so like the, the prescriptions that we get for how to behave and how to think exist outside of any particular context, right? Like there's no culture or society or collective or community. Right. There's just right. one person acting in a particular way to another person. Right? Which makes people feel good and allows people yes. to forget about all of the things that are happening out there. And yeah, it's complete bullshit because the world does not work that way. No, and it, but it also distracts, right? Like from yeah. a from a different kind of ideology that would be damaging uh, to the worldview of billionaires, right? Like, right. So the way you know, I think the way that I think about it is that what these ads and what all of his movies and all of his television shows and all of his radio ads and and like all of this stuff is articulating is just the ideal version of neoliberal ideology. And like and, and neoliberalism, it, 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 just to be clear with listeners, is a word that gets thrown around a lot and it can be confusing and it often means a lot of different things. Uh, but uh, for me, I think that it's summed up best by uh, Margaret Thatcher's famous remark uh, that there, uh, quote, there's no such thing as society. There are individual men and women and there are families. End quote, right? So there's no class antagonism. What an awful quote. We're very bad, right? Like very bad quote. <laughs> but but also I think probably like the dominant way that human beings in the United States see the world, right? Like that what what saying there is no society means is that there is no class conflict. There's no group interests, no communities. There's just individual people acting in their own self-interest on the market. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. Like from my worldview, just to be completely transparent, you couldn't make a statement that was more wrong, that was more counter to my understanding of metaphysics. <laughs> you know? yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I agree. Right. Like, but, and this is why, right. Like this is why it's ideological and, and this is what I want to talk about. Right. So like when we talk about what neoliberalism means definitionally, like one of the things that it means is that we tend to understand what many of us will call society as just a collection of individuals. Right. This is one of the basic assumptions of, uh, of economics, which is that people are just kind of atomic self-interested actors going around the world, trying to maximize their pleasure, um, uh, and profitability. But the other thing that it means, uh, the other thing that neoliberalism means is preferring market based solutions to any kind of social ill. Right. So, uh, the, well, with charter schools, right, like you have a you have a public education problem. Well, OK, let's uh, let's introduce more choice. Let's privatize it so it's more competitive. And, you know, things will shake themselves out. Right. Like that will be. A better system because you have people competing and you have people able to make choices. And so there's more freedom. And so that that's better. Right. Same thing with healthcare. You got a healthcare problem. Well, let's let's marketize it. Let's uh, let's introduce more choice into the system and, and everything will work out for the best that way. Yeah. All of us here are familiar with the idea. OK, so like. Very clearly, uh, billionaires are, are interested in, or, or beholden to this ideology because it benefits them. When you marketize things, uh, the people who already have wealth are able to uh, use that wealth to capitalize on the new markets and increase their wealth, right? So there's, a, there's an economic incentive for them to believe in this particular ideology. Yeah. 
Uh, if we think for just a minute about this ideology that 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 Anschutz is is pushing, is propagandizing, and all of these things, we realize that, like he's marketizing morality. <laughs> right? He's turning ethical action into a kind of market. In fact. He's very explicit about it. The slogan is pay it forward, right? Like he turns moral acts into a commodity, into something that individuals exchange in a free and open market. So like a, an action that you do is a kind of chit that you get, that you like, you, cre you create this value and you pass it on to someone else and then they increase that value by investing it in another person. That's right? interesting. And so like the circulation of, of moral imperatives in a society comes to look a lot like the circulation of capital. When you look at what morality is in that way, then there's no such thing as social responsibility. If there's no such thing as society, then there's no such thing as social responsibility. There's no class consciousness. When, when you reduce morality to to like like these vague attitudes like oh you should value wonder and uh you should have confidence or or whatever the moral universe that you occupy begins and ends with person to person interaction right like that that yeah like that's what you said earlier is like i don't want anybody to get the wrong idea you should be kind Absolutely agree. But that's not where morality ends. Right. right? Like that, yeah. that, that yeah. that's not the alpha and omega of moral action. Right. Like that. Yes, you should be kind in your interpersonal interactions, but you should also understand. You should also strive to understand how the way that the world is structured is often unfair. Right. That there are uh, uh, there are structural forms of exclusion and oppression that people experience that you might not even be aware of. Right. This kind of morality is conservative in a in like a very concrete and straightforward sense, in the sense that it it seeks to preserve the status quo, right? So if you don't have any sort of thing as society, nothing, no sort of institutions or structures that you can change, that morality is only a matter of interpersonal interaction, then that that by default reinforces the status quo because it doesn't seek to change anything right. uh, outside of interpersonal interactions, right? So like racism. Uh, is is something that like doesn't exist anywhere outside of like whether you like smile at somebody or uh, uh, <laughs> right you know, yeah uh, whatever right like uh, uh, gender inequality is reduced to like sexual harassment in the workplace and there, there's no sort of like structural aspects to uh, to to gender uh, discrimination right like and so that's it right and so like and the the last you know the sort of last like nut that I want to introduce and I want I wish I could uh, I wish I could do a Zizek voice I don't know if i should try to do don't is, is it any accident then um uh but actually like, pretty you good. Know, imagine this imagine this in a zizek voice right like is it any accident then that the Koch brothers own all of the greeting card companies should we read something beyond uh a private equity investment uh, in the fact that the Koch brothers own all of the greeting cards in the united states are the platitudes that greeting cards contain not the highest expression of billionaire market morale. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that's good. That's, that's good. That's good. I actually, I don't even remember who you're talking about. Um, I kind of spaced on it, and so I'm really excited to hear about it. You sent me some notes, and I was like, whoa, uh, there's some crazy ideas here that I uh, would not suspect would come up in a conversation about billionaires. Yeah, well, here we are. So I'm talking about David Sun, who is the co-founder of Kingston Technologies, a company that you may have heard of if you've used flash drives. Um, it's a leader in yes. surface mount memory chip technology oh i'm a i'm a big fan of flash memory um so the remember when computers used to break after like two years because the hard drives would wear out yeah they don't do that anymore yeah they're getting it better at it we're gonna talk well i don't know what we're gonna talk about maybe not quite that but <laughs> 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 um the story, David's son's story is kind of interesting. He's a Taiwanese immigrant who came to the United States in 1977. 
And he and his business partner, John Tu, uh, launched their first business in the early 80s. Their first business had to do with memory chips in computers, and they sold this business for six million bucks. And then- Wow, that's pretty low. Well, that's that's what's kind of interesting. These guys made a, made a little bit of money, a significant amount of money, but were like psyched to have made that money. And they were like, you know what? We're out. We're done. We're investing this money in the stock market. <laughs> All things are good. That's awesome. Yeah. They sound very cool. They so. are kind of cool. And I'll continue to come back to that. So what happened was that they got burned about as bad as anybody could have possibly gotten burned in the stock market crash of 1987. Black uh-huh. Monday, they lost almost all their money and woke up like near broke and were like, what are we going to do now? At this particular moment in the 80s, it was the rise of the computer industry. Computers obviously weren't than what they are now, but they were starting to develop. When was the first personal computer that you had in your home, like as a, in your family home? I think I had the Apple II C. That's what we had. Yeah. Um, I did use an Apple II E at school, maybe somewhere. I don't know. Um, but yeah, the Apple II C, the smaller one was the first one. There might've been another PC, non-Apple something. I was very jealous. I had a couple of friends who had a uh, Commodore 64. I don't think we had ever had that cool games. Yeah. And, yeah. So the, right. no, but Sorry no, no, it's, Just no, curious. it's good. I mean, we're in this period of like, it's like the primordial phase of PC culture. And it's important to know that because this is sort of how they got in on the game early on. So after they lost all their money, they were trying to figure out how to basically create a new business. And in that moment, there was, a, as it turns out, a global shortage of computer memory modules to upgrade memory mm-hmm. on PCs. And there was no like global supply chain. There was no infrastructure in place to supply these memory upgrades for people who needed more mm-hmm. memory. So Uh, David Sun had a background in this and he realized that there was a need for this because people were asking him about it. And he started to work out of his garage, soldering these chips onto these memory sticks. He hired his seventh grade son to help him solder these chips. In the beginning, he paid his son like 50 cents a chip. (laughs) And They were selling these for a massive profit for a short period of time, but it allowed them to build up a certain amount of capital and continued the business. And so for a period of a few years, they actually had a monopoly on the entire industry because they were what they were doing is they were using old chip technology, but but soldering them onto this new substrate Mm. that was being used in the new computers. And they sort of figured out how to replace these Texas instrument memory sticks in a way that no one else was interested in even trying to do because everybody was. They were like real tink tinkerers for the digital age. Exactly. Like Victorian era tinkerers. Yeah. But Uh, there's not that much information about David Sun on the Internet. There's some interviews that you can find. There's like one YouTube video where he's doing a tech conference appearance. But, you know. I have to say, like listening to David Sun talk in the context of the show and all the billionaires that we that, that we come into contact with here is remarkably refreshing because he's not your typical billionaire in so many different ways. I mean, when when he talks about the genesis of his company, he's he's very humble. For example, when people asked him in this interview, how how does how did your business get started? He's like enthusiastic and gleeful and it's like luck, (laughs) nothing but luck. (laughs) So lucky. (laughs) He describes like how, how stupid it was that he was able to make this amount of money. He was like, it's old technology. We didn't invent anything. 
I just soldered some things on a stick. (laughs) (laughs) You know, he's like, I made so much money on this stupid thing. This is a quote. So stupid. (laughs) So stupid. (laughs) (laughs) It made me kind of love him, you know, coupled with the fact that he was willing to like retire with much less money. And the fact that they started another business was just because they lost everything. So not, not in the same genus of billionaire of of so many of the people that we've encountered so far. So given that we're dealing with memory storage today, I wanted to spend some time thinking about the global data sphere and the digital transformation that is transforming reality as we know it. And as sort of general quasi-historical way, ideas related to memory. And this is like a massive idea. We're not going to do justice to it. We'll come back to it in future episodes. Yeah, this is exciting. It's like it's an idea that's very ripe for the show because what we're talking about basically is infrastructure of memory, right. like materialized memory. Right. right. So I want to scratch the surface of some what I think are some interesting ideas, you know, and I'm not sure the best way to do this. I mean, because we on the show have some awareness that (laughs) academics are pretty much at this moment in the history of civilization, pretty much universally reviled. (laughs) And by us too. I, we try not to get too academic here on the show, but I'm going to, this is the reason, the main reason I'm doing a podcast is because I don't want to be an academic. (laughs) (laughs) Like like, I need to do something else more useful with my time. So I'm going to flirt with disaster a little bit here. And if it's awful, stop me and, you know, we can always cut things out. But um, the big questions that I want to sort of ponder today is, one, how have we gotten to this place as a civilization and as a species where we're becoming increasingly obsessed with memory storage? And two, where might this obsession be leading us into the future? So, yeah, man, I have some I have some. Big weird. I bet you do, because I know that you've studied this and I've studied this and maybe I'll I'll go ahead and disclose, you know, both Chad Mm -hmm. and I are advisees of the media historian and philosopher uh, John Durham Peters. A lot of the ideas that we're going to talk about today, he has elaborated on at length. It's sort of a pet enthusiasm of his. Maybe we'll link to one of his pieces for those super nerds who want to go into the weeds on some of this stuff. So these ideas aren't coming directly from me, certainly, but they're ideas that I've been trained on and we're both sort of aware of. And Chad, I'm sure you have some interesting spins on all of this stuff. And I thought I'd begin by talking about thinkers of the 19th century. There's a connection here in a way to the last episode. Um, We talked a little bit on the last episode about people who were obsessed with the idea of waste and eliminating waste and improving efficiency in all these different ways. And there's a, there's oh, yeah. another, we talked about Taylor. It, yeah, exactly. Time, and Frederick there's Taylor. another discourse that's not completely unrelated here. That's simmering around the same period of time, which has to do with memory storage. And the main, oh. the main idea, the main notion that I'd like to touch on is this sort of utopian fantasy that certain people were indulging in during the mid and late 19th century, especially, although people have continued to indulge in it in different ways since then, that the, the, the universe is actually a perfect recording medium, that everything that's yeah. ever happened has been recorded in some way by some elemental substance that if only we had the proper playback device, we could perfect reread. Yeah, it's a it's, it's a fantasy, utopian fantasy of perfect information. And a lot of people talk about yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Leibniz, yeah. Goethe, yeah, uh, right. You know, I, a bunch of Victorian people who I'm sure. You're well, I'm, I was going to mention Charles Babbage, the 19th century yeah. inventor, who's difference engine, which is an early sort of predecessor to the computer. He imagined that, quote, the air itself is one vast library. Balfour Stewart and P.G. Tate, who I know you know something about. I do. Um, <clears throat> they were they were um, very religious Victorians, and they 
uh, thought that God would never create a universe in which so much wasted energy, so much information just dissipated into chaos and noise uh, because uh, because waste was sinful. And so their idea was that like, um, yeah, you know, the, the universe is made up of waves and, you know, we might not be able to read them, but that's not really the point. The point is actually that once you die and you become a soul in heaven, uh, you can sort of you have the tools to reassemble. You have the media to reassemble all of this chaotic information so that you can view all of the history of the universe, all everything that has ever happened in the universe. You can look at. An experience. So it's kind of this amazing idea that a lot of different people had in different ways. I mean, the Victorian photographer, William Jerome Harrison, believed that every action that ever occurred has been recorded by, quote, action of light. You know, mm-hmm. it, there's a long intellectual history. It was the same thing. Yeah. Stuart and Tate were uh, were light guys. Yeah. They were they were um, they, they were not as concerned with sound. So so interestingly, this dream, this utopian vision has been totally debunked by modern science. Quantum physics has proven that the world is not infinitely predictable, that the more you zoom in. And we didn't cover that. But what you're bringing up is a very important point, which is not only can you read into the past, if you can see these waves, but if you have perfect information that it's every, of everything that is occurring at a particular moment, then you can extrapolate from that information and predict everything that's going to happen in the future. Oh, yeah. Right. So that's also part of the fantasy. Yeah. Which is. Uh, yeah. Sorry no, it's OK. I mean, but it's all totally wrong because quantum physics is has proven yeah. <laughs> that the world is not predictable at the infinitesimal level. The more you zoom in, the closer you look, the more chaotic things are. So, um, I mean, I think the real point here is that the, the, the idea that the world is this sort of infinitely capable storage medium, even if it's not true, is sort of an intoxicating idea. It is. As a rule, as a rule, humans struggle with the idea of loss. Uh, I, th- I think people take comfort in the idea that everything might be retrievable, including human life. You know, obviously there's a nightmarish flip side to this idea. If you give it like even a few seconds thought, I think we can all be incredibly grateful that most moments of our lives are permanently erased and lost from cosmic memory. I I mean, I have a really dumb theory about this and it's just about Snapchat, right? Like, Like as we asymptotically approached the axis of every moment of our lives being recordable all the time, we very quickly realized that that's an absolute nightmare. Right. Yeah. And what we now need are, uh, are, Uh, like communication media that guarantee us that it will not record stuff. Right. (laughs) So, okay. But at this particular moment of technological history, we're doing exactly the opposite. We're doing as a, as a civilization and as a group of industries, everything that we can to accumulate an unprecedented amount of data. And this is like, like, arguably one of the defining characteristics of this moment of, of history, you know, so here's a few stats to chew on 90% of all data ever created has been generated and stored in the last couple of years. Yeah. And, and the thing is I've heard that statistic for the last 15 years and it's always true every yeah. year, right? Because data is growing. We are accumulating data at a really, truly stunning rate. People are expecting the total amount of data created by 2020 will amount to 44 zettabytes. One zettabyte is the equivalent to a trillion gigabytes. So uh, to put this like crazy large number into some kind of context. If this number is right, it, it'll mean that there are 40 times more bytes 
in the world than there are stars in the universe. That stars we can in the see. universe. I yeah. knew you were going to say that. I knew. It w- I knew the only metric that you could use as an analogy would be stars in the universe. They're all. They're all astronomical comparisons. Right, so, there's nothing else, right? You can't even talk about grains of sand on all of the beaches in the world because it doesn't even come close to how much. That is right. Like, right. And, and I mean, and, there's another example of this that proves your point. They're saying that by 2025, we will have reached 175 zettabytes, which means if you were to store the entire data sphere on DVDs, then you would have a stack of DVDs that would go to the moon 23 times. But it's like, that does nothing to help me figure out. I mean, it's just like one of these, like you've heard the stacks to the moon before. It's kind of a tired comparison, but it's just like, it's just an astronomical scale. Another way of getting at this statistic, 175 zettabytes by 2025, if everyone, the entire human population, were using an internet connection of 25 megabytes per second, which is a relatively speedy connection, um, and downloading info every second of every day, it would take the total human population 81 days to complete the download. So it, <laughs> it's like we are, com- we are, we are, again, that makes no sense. To yeah. Me. <laughs> it's all nonsense. It's impossible. It's just a lot of data and it's only going to be more data, at least in the medium term, you know? So the connection that I wanted to draw is that we're, we're right now hearing a sort of similar rhetoric of infinitude in the discourse about memory storage in the cloud to what oh, we were yeah. hearing in the 19th century. You know, so, some, yeah. not all of the stats that I've just mentioned, but some of them were lifted from a white paper that was recently put out by Seagate. And, you know, one of the section headings of this paper simply says, global data sphere expansion is never ending. You know, like, okay. Like maybe, true, dude. <laughs> you know? and you know why? And I don't mean to get crazy here, but uh, to go back to the Victorians that we were talking about earlier, every single one of them was a thermodynamic. Yeah, that yeah. was their whole yeah, yeah, thing, yeah. right? And so what they were talking about was energy, and the limit of the data sphere is tied to what we were talking about last week peak oil, right? In other words, right. it is tied to the carbon economy that we currently yeah. live in. And so- Absolutely. Like, uh, and I don't want to go too far down this road because this is kind of what I'm saving for the next guy that comes across our radar who's who's focusing yeah. on memory storage because the carbon aspect of it is real and important and something that we and people know yeah. that I mean they're already talking about it with Bitcoin mining right, right? now like of the, course the, yeah it's sort of become a part of public consciousness already that uh, maybe we'll get a bit is there a Bitcoin oh yeah that would be is really interesting. One I mean the carbon footprint yeah. of digital consumption right now is about to surpass if it hasn't surpassed already the carbon footprint of the aviation industry and the the the, 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 the digital consumption rates are obviously skyrocketing each year. You know, so this is a, a a really important thing to keep an eye on. But there's just when you're talking about the global memory infrastructure industry, there's too many things to kind of like touch on in a single episode. So I'm trying to like yeah. focus on what we're focusing on here. Um and to bring it back to the Kingston company, I mean their company slogan is is simply Kingston is everywhere. You know, which is which is maybe not as directly suggesting infinite storage as some of these other ideas that we've talked about. But the underlying idea is that we're rapidly moving into a future where data is constantly being created, stored, tracked, monitored, bought, sold, analyzed, and we'll be moving into a world of increased automation. And according to the techno optimists and neo tailorists out there, a world of quote, you know, increased efficiency. And I mean, there's Mm. so many problems that we can point to here with what, what, what does that world look like? To me, it looks bleak, you know? Um, But I want to save the more full on critique of these things for, for the next data storage 
person. I think that's smart. I, I would, I, yeah, I'd really like to have similar conversations again. And it's going to come up because as, as we've already talked about on previous shows, the big thing that every billionaire is just chomping or chomping at the bit about is AI. Yeah. Yeah. And it's mainly uh, surveillance AI. So it's facial recognition and other biometrics. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. I'm not sure if we're going to permanently lose listeners or just rack up one star reviews from bringing up this idea, but I thought for a second we would talk about <laughs> Bernard Stiegler's notion of epiphylogenetic memory. Okay. I, well, well, let me just cut you off and say, um, Zero people who are listening to this show are going to be upset about hearing about uh, a cool new. OK. All right. OK. Thanks for having. Of. And if they have heard of it, then they'll be like, right on. I also <laughs> okay. love that. Concept. So, so the yeah, concept, so like, I think it's uh, kind of interesting. It's a concept that I know that Chad and I are both pretty familiar with. But basically, the French media philosopher Bernard Stiegler argues that. Technology and specifically memory storage technology is evolving all on its own outside the human germline, quote, by means other than life. So he <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a crazy a idea. Point. But but the basic piece of anthropological evidence that he leverages in building this case is that the human cerebral cortex really stopped evolving in the Neanderthal stage. Like our brain biology isn't very much more advanced now. Once you're once you're walking upright, you're basically done. Than it was then, and he points out that humanity's ability to store data and store memory has increased in rather dramatic fashion <laughs> since then. You know, yeah. so th all of this is to to support this argument that memory is evolving outside of human bodies. I mean, that's a very weird and interesting thing to think about, right? Like, like the, that, um, and I'm not sure, you know, there are very few other areas of human cognitive activity, like maybe calculation or something, right, that do that. But like memory has evolved by leaps and bounds yeah. beyond the biological capacities that we had as of it's so interesting ago. it's so right. interesting and like i don't quite know what to make of it but you know it, it's clear that these ideas are sort of like in the air and like and i would argue deeply connected to some of these 19th century ideas victorian ideas that we've been discussing you know like yeah. you may have heard a, a couple of years ago that some Researchers at MIT claim to have invented this, quote, visual microphone, which can apparently recover, like, the sound of music and conversations that people are having just by analyzing vibrations in plastic bags. The vibrations are encoded. So at a certain level, I mean, it's interesting, at a certain level, there might be recording devices that can recover way more than we think that we can recover, you know? And certainly we all know that that hard drives are almost impossible to destroy. The, the, the data that we create is recoverable by oh, all man. kinds of people who know how to recover it. There may be devices that can record things beyond our understanding of what they can record. Like that's artificial intelligence, right? It's like is figuring out like, and, and, and recording things that are, that we did not initially intend them to record. So like, penetrating into the unseen universe. The other perhaps most significant example of this moving into the future is DNA because DNA yes. could be the new hard drives. There are these studies where they have encoded DNA with like old movies and information. Right. This is another one of these statistics that makes absolutely no sense, but apparently like <laughs> all it takes is four grams of DNA to store all the information that humanity produces in a single year. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what that means. But I don't like, know what uh, that means either, 
but it means that like all of the data farms, all of the, all of the hard drives, all of the energy that's being used to fuel all of these things, if they could figure out a way, I mean, I, again, what does that mean? I don't know. Well, it means, it means space, right? Like, like, okay. Okay. This is getting very, like, this is like a, this is like a mushroom trip at this point when memory gets to the point of being able to be stored in an infinitely small space, namely like a singularity, uh, and does not require any, uh, or at least, you know, a negligible amount of energy, uh, to persist through time. Then the fantasy of these Victorian weirdos that we were talking about actually does exist, right? Because you have an you have a more or less infinite storage space to to keep all of the information that you could ever need. And you have the energy capacities to maintain that memory over time. And the fact that, that that storage medium might be genetic material, just, <laughs> just yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, now there's nothing else to say. Now we're at the point of the episode where we need to introduce our billionaires for next episode. We're going to spin our random billionaire generator roulette wheel. Are you ready to do this? I am super ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Uh, the first one is Blair Perry Okaden. Okay. Blair Perry Okaden. Uh, Cox Enterprises. What is Cox? Cable. I don't even know Cox. Cox Cable. You know Cox. No, I don't. Cox. Oh, you never had Cox Cable. No. Where did I live when I had Cox Cable? I don't even remember at this point. So telecommunications. Um, yeah. Telecom. Um, privately right. held media conglomerate. All right. So Blair Perry Okaden. Okay. Let's do the second guy. And we came up with Richard Peary. P double E R. P double E R Y Peer of Peary Irrigola. Ugh. Silicon Valley real estate developer. All right. Who do you How want? Annoying. Who do that? you want? Um, I had a media conglomerate for this week. And I think that sounds more fun. So I will cede that to you because I had the fun one for this week. I'll take Richard Peary, okay. the real estate developer. Okay. Well, I know that in the last week, two weeks, I know we've picked up at least a few new listeners. I want to thank all of you out there who are starting to pay attention to the show. Um, please do like and subscribe. It's a lame thing to say, but just want to remind everybody that we need to get the word out. You know, we're still trying to make a name for ourselves out there in the potosphere. Big, big shout out to the Grubstakers guys. Uh, your podcast rules. And thank you so much for uh, shouting us out on Twitter. Thanks, guys. We're going to do our best to be back here in two weeks with our next episode. Um, thanks again for being here. Anything else you got for them, Chad? You know, I, I have to say a uh, white clug uh, ruby red grapefruit is probably the best flavor. Um, raspberry <laughs> is the worst flavor. Okay. Curious. Fuck, man. You're wasted. <laughs> <laughs>